about health benefits. They didn't talk when we bring in lunches about whether it's good lunch or bad lunch. It's evolved over the last 15 years and uh, as, as time has gone on we've made it more comprehensive. So it includes things like uh, weekly nurses visits, educational activities, one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one counseling, as well as uh, annual uh, wellness testing. <clears throat> Medicine in general is a mystery to people besides diet, nutrition, and activity. A lot of people don't understand when they get a diagnosis uh, what they can truly do to help themselves additionally. And a nurse on staff or visiting once or twice a week can certainly help individuals understand the significance of what following the medical routine can do for them. What we want to do is just incorporate a healthy lifestyle throughout the year and continue with education of our employees about you know different health care and weight loss and how to exercise, how to eat right. I've seen a lot of people make better choices, I guess you could say. Instead of the double cheeseburgers at lunch, you know, you see some people making that conscious effort to uh, hey, maybe that's not the greatest for me, let's let's eat something a little bit healthier, you know. The guys that I work with, they don't, they say it's weird to hear me say, well, that's got 700 calories in it, I'm not eating that, you know, and I never was conscious about that stuff, I just didn't look good and taste good, I ate it. So, and now I actually pay attention to it. You know, what, what does that have in it? Do I really need all of what that, you know, can I break this one meal up into like three different meals if I just eat something with, without 600 milligrams of sodium and 850 calories? Well, I think I've been offended on the health screenings, the cholesterol checks, and the blood pressure checks. I've also benefited on the weight loss and the tracking. I've lost 110 pounds in the last two years. So. We just think it's better in the best interest of the company and the employee to offer uh, incentives and support to increase the loyalty <coughs> of our employees. but you still have time to get your brackets filled out for the <clears throat> um, We're going to talk about lockout tagout. And as you all probably had in front of you, there is a, what we're calling a training aid now. We're not calling it a training quiz. Um, we're trying this out with not putting your names on them, but we want you to fill them out as we go through the program. And we're going to take a look at them. And as a company, we're going to see if we got it. Okay, and we're not going to individually um, single out anybody that they, they didn't understand it, but if as a company we don't think that everybody understood what we talked about today, then we um, will go through it again. So, fill that rider, you got to go through it twice. <clears throat> So, no need to put your name on it. If you do, that's fine, Steve. You went ahead. I'm going to give you some notes on it, too. Okay. Um, now, I know that, by and large, most of you aren't out in the shop or out in the field, you know, turning wrenches and welding yourselves, but it certainly is something that the integrity of a lockout tagout program is really important that everybody in a company understands the components of it 
so that we can respect the integrity of it. And, and if one of you is out in the shop and you don't understand the lockout tagout policy and you, you know, violate it in some way, you could be putting someone else at risk. But I know that a lot of you go in the field um, and a lot of you go in the shop, so it is important that we talk about it. <clears throat> Basically, the scope of, <clears throat> you have to bear with me, I'm getting over a cold, so I apologize for the voice, but um, the scope of the lockout-tagout program, and, and as OSHA kind of puts it out, is it covers um, servicing and maintenance of equipment where unexpected energy startups or release of stored energy could result in an injury, okay? <clears throat> so... Basically, any time that we're going to, to be performing some kind of maintenance on a piece of equipment, we, we need to take into account all the energy sources. And, you know, I, some of you know that I was, I was at one of your job sites um, earlier this week, and we were talking about lockout, tagout. And the, meet, the first thing that, that pe comes to people's minds is electricity when we talk about lockout, tagout. And certainly electricity is a primary source of energy that we have to take into account. However, the reality is, is that there are lots of types of, of energy that we will be talking about that we have to take into account. So it doesn't say the unexpected startup of ele electrical equipment or the un unexpected, you know, electrically energies, you know, energized. It's, it's energy. And <clears throat> energy takes a lot of forms, and we have to take all of those into account because all of them could potentially hurt us. Uh, why do we use a lockout tagout? As we said, we're going to protect those people who are working on the equipment. And, um, you know, it's a recognized hazard. Lots and lots of people have hurt themselves, lost fingers, died because they failed to lock out and they failed to follow procedures. Or maybe they, they did go shut the breaker off, but they didn't take into account the gravity or the kinetic energy or the pneumatic or hydraulic, something like that. So um, it's, a, it's definitely a recognized hazard, and statistically, lots of people get hurt every, every year. This lockout-tagout policy has been around for a very long time, but companies either A, <clears throat> don't know how to follow it properly, or B, just choose not to. And, and people get hurt, and, and that's not, I mean, obviously that's what we want to avoid here. Um, anytime that an employee is required to remove or bypass a guard or safety device, that's a good indication that, hmm, maybe I need to use lockout tagout. So that's those little triggers that, that say, if I'm taking off this guard, that guard's there for a reason, now I need to find out a way that I'm going to protect myself in lieu of that guard being there. <coughs> and any time that employees require to place a body part into an area that would be called the danger zone, zone or the point of operation, the place where the, the rubber meets the road, where the blade meets the stock, where the, you know, the place that, that's going to bite you. <coughs> there is an exception, um, and, and this comes in, you know, production equipment a lot of times when you know, you don't necessarily have to lock out and tag out every time that you, you need to get in for something that would be considered a routine minor adjustment. But um, those, we can't be too liberal with that definition. We, we have to make sure that, that if we are putting people at harm's, at harm's way, that, we, that we're figuring out a way to protect them. And those, those, that exception is only relevant if we provide other means to protect the employee, maybe like a light curtain. Maybe we're not going to lock out the press, but there's a light curtain that's going to prevent it from coming down. So we have to be able to verify that we have another way to protect um, in order to utilize that, that uh, exception. It doesn't apply to cord and plug connected equipment. Basically what that's saying is, is that if, if I've got a table saw and I, I Ordinarily, I'm going to work on it, and ordinarily, I would need to lock out, tag out. Well, if I can unplug it from the wall, and I can keep that plug in my sight and in my control while I'm working on it, then I don't have to lock it out. That's, that's basically what that is saying. <clears throat> there is a, uh, 
energy control procedures, and, and basically these are procedures that we should have for all of our big pieces of equipment. And it's just a process of us looking at, you know, identifying all the energy sources. You know, just when when I when I've done these for big pieces of equipment, I just sit down with the with the operators and with the engineers of that have worked on that piece of equipment. I say, say okay, let's brainstorm. What what are all the sources of energy that this piece of equipment has? And we go through and we list them. You know, electric electricity, hydraulics, and just go through the whole list. And then once we've got that list of the energy sources, then it's real simple. We say, okay, we said we have electricity. How do we control that? Well, in order to control that electricity on this, we shut off breaker 22 in box 19. Good, that's, part, that's the first step of our energy control procedure. Then step two, hydraulics. Okay, well I disconnect here, lock this valve out, bleed the hydraulics off. That's how I control that energy, just go down the list. And those are the energy control procedures that you, we should have in place for all of our equipment. I'm going to go through some definitions just to, to help, you know, these are things that when we talk about lockout, tagout, we, we use some of these terms and so it's helpful to understand some of the terms to understand the program. First and foremost, in the lockout, tagout policy or program, and in your lockout, tagout policy and program, there are two types of people. There are affected people and authorized people. The first people, the, op the affected people, is people whose job requires them to operate or use equipment that is subject <coughs> to lockout tagout. Okay, so this is just the people working around the equipment that may be locked out. So really, we're all affected people from time to time. As soon as you go out on the shop floor and there's maintenance being done to a piece of equipment, we are an affected person. You go out into the field and you get around some of this equipment. You're an affected person. So anybody that's working around equipment subject to lockout tagout is an affected person under your policy. Then you've got the authorized people. And that's just simply the people that, the maintenance people. These are the people that are doing the maintenance, doing the work on the equipment. These are the people that are more heavily trained in, in lockout tagout. They understand and, and have been trained to recognize those hazards and identify those energy sources and follow those procedures. They're the ones that the locks have been assigned to and that they have the, the knowledge of how to lock out a piece of equipment and, and isolate those energy sources. So two people, affected and authorized. <clears throat> Can you be both? From time to time, yeah. <clears throat> Energized, just, I mean, I think that probably, you know, we all could, could throw out a definition of energized and come up with something close to this, but from an OSHA perspective, energized means anything that, that is connected to an energy source or contains residual or stored energy. So even once you unplug something, sometimes there's capacitors, there's, there's uh, reservoirs that still hold energy that we still have to uh, contend with, you know. <clears throat> Energy isolating device, it's a mechanical device that can physically lock out something, okay? So the device is something that can actually physically lock it out, like these breaker locks. And the device is actually, I mean obviously you guys know that's a lock. The device is actually the red part that, that once you turn the, the breaker off, it goes over and, and uh, then you, put, you apply the lock. Energy sources. This is just a, it's certainly not an all-inclusive list of sources of energy, but it's, it's, a, it's a short laundry list of the types of energy. Um, any source of electrical, mechanical, hydraulic, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, thermal energy. You know, sometimes we don't think of that as an energy source, but you go over Gibbs Die Casting and work in one of their, you know, um, aluminum furnaces <coughs> or what we talked about in our 30 hour class. How hot are the ovens that sometimes you guys hold your breath and go into? We don't do this. So. <laughs> I mean, theoretically, if you were to hold your breath and go into an oven. What happens in the class stays in the class. Oh, man. I missed that part. My bad. I'm not calling Steve out. I don't think it was him. It was somebody else. Um, but 
thermal energy is something that we have to contend with as well. And oftentimes, we do bypass that, that control for that energy source. And it's, the purpose of it is, I mean, we can lock out electricity real quick. We can lock out pneumatics real quick. We can lock out hydraulics real quick. But thermal energy takes time. You know, you got to plan ahead. You got to let it cool down. You've got to, you know, so it's not something that you can just turn the heat off and it's done. I walk in. So it, it takes some planning. So sometimes those things get a little bit bypassed. I will tell you that it's not safe to go in your ovens when you just shut them off, as you probably know. That. Then there's lots of other energy sources. You know, what energy source um, did that rock have? Gravity. Gravity. That's another one. Um, you know, anybody that's ever changed a tire on a, on a hilly road knows that gravity is a source of energy that you need to, to isolate. The lockout, the definition of lockout is the placement of a lockout device on an energy isolating or an energy isolating device in accordance with the established procedure. So that's, that's just literally what lockout means in, in OSHA's terminology. We talked about devices already. Um, just, this is kind of a, a list of, of activities that, that OSHA would define as, as uh, maintenance that might require lockout, tagout to be uh, used. Um, constructing, installing, setting up, adjusting, sometimes even inspecting, you know, if we're going to put ourselves in, in harm's way, modifying, maintaining, or servicing machines. So those are typical things that we do when we go into a piece of equipment to uh, perform maintenance is, is some of these things right here. <coughs> do we always lock out, use lockout and tag out when we're going in and doing these things? I think probably the answer is no. We, should we? The answer is emphatically yes. Putting a lock and putting a device on on um, to isolate energy source is a a you know a physical thing that you can do to prevent the energy from being restarted. Sometimes that's difficult to do, and when that's difficult to do, we can use a tag out. Okay, it's certainly a more passive thing. You know, anybody can just go rip the tag off of a breaker and turn the breaker on. But when I started this and I talked about the integrity of a lockout tag out program. We ought to be able to put a tag on something and it was, we, we had as much confidence that that energy wasn't going to be turned on as if we actually locked it out. Now we still prefer to go lock it out. That's, that's the first and, and, and best choice. But in, in lieu of being able to lock it out, tagging it out ought to be just as good. And if any of you have ever picked up a piece of equipment that was tagged out and said, well, I know why it was tagged out, and it's not that big a deal. I'm going to go ahead and use it because I need to use it real quick just, just one time. Well, that's, you just really you know, degraded, the, or degraded the, the integrity of that program. And, and so we have to respect those tags. Even if you think you know why it was tagged out, there may be multiple reasons why it was tagged out, and, and you're not always going to know those things. Some general requirements of the program, as we talked about, the energy control procedures. Training is a big part of it, is just making sure that, you know, the affected people know what to look for when they get out there and, and, and understand how to work around the lockout program. And then the authorized people, as we said, they, they have an increased level of training that they have to go through. But training is a big part of really all safety programs. But periodic inspections. OSHA requires you to annually to review those procedures, those lockout procedures for those um, individual pieces of equipment to make sure they're still accurate because things change as you all know and maybe maybe when those procedures were written you know that breaker 22 in box 19 was accurate but some changes have been made and all of a sudden now it's a different breaker in a different box and so we got to make sure that they're still accurate. <clears throat> Um, basically what OSHA says is that if, a, if, if a, a source of energy 
is capable of being locked out, then the, the standard calls for you to use a lockout device. So do, we can't just say, well, <coughs> we, we have a high level of integrity in, in our company and we're not going to spend the money on buying lockout devices. We're just going to use tag outs because nobody here will violate a tag out policy. And because OSHA says that if it's capable of being locked out, then, then they want you to lock it out. The tag should only be used for identification purposes and in those instances where a lock is, is kind of impossible to, to use. Um, all the materials and hardware that's utilized in that picture down there is, I know it's kind of small, but is um, those are lockout kits. Those have all the devices, they have all the locks. Um, and all of those things, you know, OSHA requires to be provided by the employer. Um, we don't, don't need to have employees being required to go out and, and get what they need to keep themselves safe. The locks and uh, devices need to be singularly identified. Basically, if, if I put a lock on something, anybody ought to be able to get up and, and, and look at that lock and see that <coughs> Scott Hendricks is locked. And I know that because his name's on it, or I know that because Scott Hendricks is all his locks are blue. And part of our program is that all, Scott Hendricks has the blue locks. And, Steve Whitehead has the yellow locks, and so whatever, they have to be able to be identified back to the person. Also, the device can only be used for controlling energy. I can't use my lock on my locker and on my desk drawer and then go use it to isolate energy. That lock is just for the lockout uh, program. And also, meeting, it needs to meet these other requirements. They need to be capable of withstanding the environment for the time period. You know, sometimes the devices, it's not as big a deal, but what about tags? We've all seen tags that have been hanging there since 1892, right? <laughs> Can you read them? You know, they need to be um, durable enough to withstand the environment that they're in. You know, if they're in a, a moist environment, then they should be laminated. If they're, um, they're acidic environment, they should be acid resistant. I mean, they, we need to be able to identify them. And if, if I take a Sharpie and write the information on it, and two days later, that information's not legible because of the environment that it's in, then we haven't lived up to um, the requirements. Uh, they need to be standardized. You know, we don't want to have different color tags out there and different color devices. I mean, part of our program, we should have standardized devices and tags that we utilize. They have to be substantial enough to prevent removal without excessive force. Okay, so, you know, you can't put a balsa wood uh, device on, okay? I mean, we, we, sometimes we do have to remove these devices, um, maybe take bolt cutters and cut a lock off, and there are procedures that, that we can follow to do that, but we, um, we also don't want the devices to be so easily removed that anybody could just go up and say, well, I don't like this on here. Let me it off. So, and um, they need to be uh, substantial enough to prevent in inadvertent or accidental removal. There's just an example of uh, uh, some of the equipment that the tags over there. You know, they've, they've gone a step further in this example, and they don't just have the name of someone. They've got a photo ID of someone. It's not a requirement, but it's a nice touch. And obviously, um, uh, the company that's that's use, using that has a pretty extensive lockout tag out program, and probably all the maintenance people have tags with their pictures on. Them. And then the locks, we see they can be color coded, or they've got places where you can write your names, or you can have numbers on them, so we can go to a list and see that that Steve Whitehead's number fourteen. We talked already about the training requirements, but um, the authorized employee, we just, just uh, they need to be able to understand how to recognize those energy sources so that they, if you don't understand what energy sources a piece of equipment has, then you don't have any ability 
to isolate and control those energy sources before it bites you. It's important as we talked, you know, one of the training requirements is the limitations of the tags and, and what we talked about as far as respecting that integrity of, of the lockout tag out program and, you know, the durability of tags and also the fact that a tag can be violated. And if we have contractors that come in and, and work in our facilities, maybe they're the ones that have to turn something on. So. Um, the, the device is certainly better, but understanding those limitations of the of the tag out pro, part of the program are, are real important. We would want to retrain all employees and make adjustments to the program anytime there was job assignment changes. Um, if the equip if the equipment presents new hazards, maybe we we add something to that piece of equipment that didn't exist before. We would want to retrain everybody. Um, if there's some change in our policy or our energy control uh, plan and um, also if if there's some evidence that the the program is inadequate so I mean what what would be an example of evidence of a program being inadequate or uh, are us identifying that the program was inadequate team member not following it witness somebody not following the procedures <coughs> We have an injury that, through the investigation of the of the accident, we discover that had they locked out that piece of equipment, then um, they they would have protected themselves. That's an indicator that we need to retrain and that our program is not working the way it should. And that's a trigger that OSHA says should require uh, new training. Notifications or communications is real important. And what authorized employees are trained to do is to notify affected employees of the, the pieces of equipment are going to be locked out. And oftentimes, you know, I always say knowledge is king. So if the more information, if I'm gonna lock out a piece of equipment, the more information that I can provide to the people, the affected people that are working around that equipment, the better chances are that they're not gonna to try to violate it. Okay, so if I, if I go in and I explain, hey, getting ready to lock out this piece of equipment, and I'm going to be in there, got to change out, you know, the die. And, and so I'm going to be in that piece of equipment, it's going to be locked out, probably going to be locked out for the next two hours, and then we'll get it going back again. Well, that, if I let everybody know that, then somebody that comes an hour from now isn't, isn't over there trying to rip tags off and get this thing started because they understand what, what's going on, you know. So... Just knowledge is king, so notification of, of, uh, to the affected employees from the authorized employees is an important part of this plan. I'll I, I, I just go through this quickly because, that, again, this is just to give you an idea of what the authorized people go through when they go through a shutdown, but here are the steps. Um, they prepare for the shutdown and some of that preparation is that communication and then they do an orderly shutdown of the equipment and what, what the most programs call for and yours calls for is to shut down the piece of equipment just like you would at the end of the day. So power buttons and shutdowns and hit the red stop button, you know, just however you would turn it off if you were leaving it for the day, go through that normal process. And then you start isolating the various energy sources. Um, you apply the lockouts and the tags and, and you dissipate any, any energy that's, re you know, residual energy that's in there, you know, bleed off the, the air pressure, bleed off the hydraulic pressure, and then you've got to verify the isolation. So once you've got everything purged and, and blocked and locked out, then go try to start the equipment up and, and see, make sure that you did. Maybe you locked out the wrong breaker and all of a sudden it's trying to start, you know. So, got to try to start the equipment and then um, test it and turn it back to the off position and then the, the work can begin. Okay, that's, that's the procedures that every authorized employee sh should be following when they go to lock out a piece of equipment. The release of that is basically just going back and, and doing the reverse of those things we just said. 
but communication again. If I'm the authorized employee, I'm wanting to communicate with everybody, hey, we're going to start removing the locks off of this, we're going to start re-energizing this piece of equipment, and so that everybody knows that there's no, there's no gray areas, everybody knows what's getting ready to happen. And as I mentioned, I talked about contractors. You know, we, we need to make sure that, that when we have contractors come in, or when we are the contractor going in, that, that we are communicating with the, the owner company or the contractors communicating with you here that what their lockout policies are, you need to make sure they understand what your lockout policies are so that, that they can follow your policies when they're here. And just like, you know, we were at, Kubota. If Kubota tells you that this is how we do the lockout policy, well, then that's the way you're going to do it when you're at that job site. And you may go to a completely different job site and they're just completely different, but you need to understand that at this facility, this is how lockout tagouts performed, and at this facility, this is how lockout tagout is performed, and, and those are the things that need to be discussed on the up, up front end so that everybody knows um, knows how to follow it properly. <clears throat> are there any questions about lockout tagout? Again, I know that you guys aren't necessarily the ones out there that are going to be tearing down the piece of equipment, but you, you certainly are all affected employees. And so understanding, you know, just a little bit about this and, and why it's important really is, is something that I think we uh, shouldn't take lightly. Are there any questions? Did everybody uh, get all the answers filled out on your sheet? Do we need to go through that? We'll go through it real quick. I'm, I, I will ask the question. <laughs> Did I do past four? Yeah. Yeah. You jumped it. I, I caught it. Well, I saw, I saw Positive means. That was a test. How fast you can read? All right, let's go through it. I won't try to find this slide. Yeah. Yeah. Number one, unexpected energization of or startup or release of stored energy could cause injury to an employee. Number two, service and maintenance means employee required to remove or bypass a garter safety device or employee required to place part of body into an area that would be a danger zone during machine operation. Um, I said list two types of energy. We obviously in the slides listed more than that. So let's just kind of toss some out there. Steam. Steam. Chemical. Chemical. Gravity. Hydraulic. Okay, we get it. Um, Susan, since you got caught this, number four, lockout device is a device that uses a... I have no idea. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to call you out. I thought you got it. Positive means. Okay, a positive means. Oh, I have a positive influence. See, there you go. But... Huh? Yeah. A lockout that device is a device work. that uses an energy yeah, isolator. <coughs> Accept that answer. Mm -hmm. What the slide said was a positive means, which means that it's 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 not passive. It's positive. It's definitely uh, locks it out. And number five, a lockout tagout device must be singularly and the only device used for controlling energy, not used for other purposes. I'll try to do a better job of not skipping the slides that I pull questions <laughs> However, does everybody like this this format of doing this versus like the quiz that has powder puff answers and most of you can answer before the training, you know? All right, well, I think we're going to keep with this for a while until someone tells me to do it differently. Um, are there any questions about lockout tag? I, I would just say, just I, I was at one of your job sites, as I said, the Kubota job site, and first of all, phenomenally impressed with. I've seen your your equipment being built in pieces for a long time now. I've never seen them all put together as a 
as a completed unit. I, I, I was like, so all this stuff is your stuff? I mean, because it, it, it's kind of like, you know, what I see here is a puzzle piece. And, and when I went to Kubota, I got to see the puzzle completed, and, and it, it was very impressive. But it, it also, I know a lot of you go to the field, that, that is a, an, an amazingly dangerous place to be. First of all, there's hazards everywhere, um, and their hazards change all the time. And so I'm just going to just use this opportunity since it's fresh in my mind because we just got back that when you guys go out to the field, man, understand the, the type of environment that you're in. That, you know, there's lots of people doing lots of work and, and there are lots of things going on in there. And there may be a hole in the floor now that wasn't there 30 seconds ago. And, and it's an ever-changing, it's a, an evolving um, environment. So, um, like I said, impressed, but please be careful when you get out there. If there are no questions, thank you, and hope you all do well on your brackets. Hey, I have a question. How, how many accidents, how many recordable accidents have we had this year? Right you said that it's always just the one, wasn't it? It's one, one. or two. I think it's just one. There was one that I think was debatable whether it was recordable or not. But I I know one for sure. So how do we get to zero? Keep pumping. Constant education, constant work. Two safety incidents with subs, though. What's that? I'm sorry. We've also had two safety incidents with subs. Right. I, I think education is 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 important making sure that that you know we are giving them the knowledge that they need to work safe which i think we have but constantly reminding constantly pounding holding people accountable you know not not walking through places with blinders on you know as as we see hazards correcting them as we see unsafe acts correcting them and and i think that that's how we keep driving it down i Education and accountability. You know, being proactive and using the safety program to make suggestions.